Today, we're going to discuss a Bible study method on this episode of The Unapologetic Show, where we defend truth without compromise with Dr. Bobby Conway, the one-minute apologist. I'm your host, Tim Hall. Bobby, studying the Bible is so important for the Christian. Today, I'm hoping that you can give us a method on how to do that. So maybe what we'll do is we'll kind of just read a passage, and then you can kind of take us through this method that you've learned and that you've taught other people, particularly at our church over the years. How how does that sound to you? Well, it's important that we know how to study the Bible. The Mm. Bible is a book and it's comprised of 66 books. Right. And we have 39 books in the Old Testament. Uh, we have 27 books in the New Testament. It's written by 40 authors on three continents over a thousand year period. And it has different genres. Mm. So you have apocalyptic genre, like in the second half of Daniel or in the book of Revelation. You have poetry, like the book of Job. Uh, you have... Uh, gospel literature, you have historical literature like the book of Acts. Mm. And so when we approach the text, we want to be asking a series of questions. And so a lot of people, they show up in a small group and they start discussing, uh, what does it mean to you? Right. And that's not really what we're after. Uh, it's not what it means to us. It's what does it mean? Right. And then we figure out how to apply it in our own daily lives. And I think if we'll have a method, it it can help us to study the Bible. Picture a carpenter who has a tool belt and he has different tools that are accessible to him in building a house. Mm-hmm. So too do we as interpreters of scripture, we've got a tool belt. It's called hermeneutics, which is the science of understanding the Bible. And there's different tools that we need to utilize in order to interpret different genres of scripture. So one of the approaches that I learned uh, goes back to really Bible called but in seminary, uh, Prof. Hendricks, I got the privilege of studying under, and he was famous for his Bible study methods class. Mm. He wrote a book on Bible study methods that was really fantastic, that can be incredibly helpful for people wanting to know how to study the Bible. And Prof. Hendricks laid out a method as it related to three words. Uh, observation, interpretation, and application. And that's kind of the direction that we'll go in this program. Well, I'm looking forward to just being a student for the next 20 or so minutes and just really grasping as much as I can. I would invite the audience to do the same thing. If you're checking this out on the radio, maybe you can jot some notes down for later. If you want to catch this episode again, you can do so on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash one minute apologist, and take some notes as you watch it or listen to it a second time. So I think maybe the best way to to, um, talk about this method or to apply this method is for us to maybe just read a small passage of scripture and sure. then you can just take us through. So uh, we decided that we'll talk about Acts 1 8. So I'll go ahead and just read that out loud. It says, uh, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Seems pretty straightforward. So, mm. what well, What else would we need here to kind of unpack what's going on? Well, the reason I chose this verse is Prof. Hendricks, when we were his students, uh, required us to do an observation lesson on this verse. And he sent us home as students and said, write down 25 observations on that one verse. And that's a lot, right? Yeah, you're saying, wow. And uh, we did. We go home and we get out of the Bible and we start making all these observations. And when we turned our assignment in, he says, now go home and do 25 more observations. Well, when we were done, we had 50 observations on this one verse, Tim. Yeah. So what he was trying to do was to increase our observation powers. Mm. Great Bible teachers see more. That's what happens in observation. We learn to see more in the text and we want to observe the text before we come to the interpretation stage. Mm. So a better question in a small group setting to make this practical 
would be, what do you see in the text? And so that's what observation seeks to address. It's answering the question, what do you see? And what we see in Acts 8 is basically, when we're familiar with the rest of the book, is the outline for the entire book of Acts. Mm. But you shall receive power and the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. So the gospel falls or the spirit falls in chapter two when the gospel is proclaimed. And that's when the church begins and it starts there in Jerusalem. And then the church is to be missional and it spreads out to Judea and the Samaria. And you see that in Acts chapter eight and at the ends of the earth. And that's the way the gospel flows as Paul goes on his missionary journeys yeah. to the ends of the earth. So you want to observe, I mean, some of the things you're asking types of observatory questions mm -hmm. are who wrote the book. And so we try to understand who the author is. And we clearly learn that Luke is the author. Okay. So this is Luke's second uh, book. He wrote the gospel of Luke. Luke and Acts. Right. Just as an interesting side note, many people think Paul wrote most of the New Testament, but actually Luke is the one who wrote most of the New Testament because there's a higher word count with those two mm. books than all of Paul's 13 letters put together. Interesting. Yeah. Now, what you're looking for in the observation stage is who wrote it, who's the audience. So Theophilus, you know, right. we learned that he is the one who is the recipient. Uh, Luke says, uh, you know, to Theophilus, I sought in my former account to write to you. And so we know this is kind of a continuation yeah. where you learn about the person of Jesus in the gospel of Luke, but then you learn about how Jesus uh, relates to the church in the, in the book of Acts. And so the book of Acts, people often say, oh, it's the Acts of the Apostles. It's really the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit mm. comes upon you. And so basically what you have is the book of Acts is the spreading of the gospel in a missional movement empowered by the Holy Spirit that falls in Acts chapter two. So you're asking who the author is, who the audience is. Okay. You're looking for key words, repeated terms, Terms, unusual words. Uh, these are the types of, of questions that we're asking of the text. Acts 1.8 is very helpful because it allows us to get to the key verse of the entire book of Acts, which mm. is comprised of 28 chapters. Right. Now imagine, Tim, if you were to go to a doctor, you weren't feeling well, and you're in the waiting room, and all of a sudden the doctor walks in and he says, hi, Tim, here's your prescription. <laughs> You would think, bro, <laughs> you know, you probably wouldn't say bro, but you'd say, doctor, uh, you haven't even assessed me yet. Yeah. You haven't made observations. Mm. So it's important for him to make observations first and then draw an interpretation of what's wrong with you before giving you a prescription, which is the application. So observation is crucial. And the way that I would do this if I was encouraging people is to get yourself a journal, mm, yeah. get a memo pad, and then write observation. And you could just take Acts 1, for example, and if you want to be specific and do the lesson that we did, but let's say you wanted to work through the book of Acts, you just yeah. take Acts 1 and you would note, oh, okay, this is written by Luke, Theophilus is uh, the recipient, uh, the key verse is chapter uh, 1, verse 8, and you just start writing down a bunch of observations yeah. before you get to that next level. So when it comes to like key phrases, think about uh, Psalm 150, Psalm 150, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Uh, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Again, I say praise the Lord. And over and over again, you're seeing praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And that's the key phrase. Mm -hmm. And so if you were with your journal, writing down the key phrase, you would write down praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. You'd know that this is a Psalm about praising the Lord. And who's to praise the Lord? Everything that has breath. Uh, and then you would be able to come to the interpretation stage. And you would say, you would say, this, say that this is about in, uh, praising the Lord. How do I praise the Lord? I praise the Lord uh, with my entire being. Mm. Uh, then in the application stage, I'm going to start using my breath to better praise the Lord right. in my conversations with people, in my conversations with God. I'm going to let my life be a praise unto God. Well, okay, that, that's fantastic. This is super helpful. So if we're looking at this uh, verse that we had in Acts, Acts 1-8 here, who is 
is uh, speaking here, and who is the audience? Those are two observational questions you asked us. So let's just we'll just lay them out here. Who's who's the great? Audience? Who's talking? Yeah. So the audience is the disciples that are waiting for the Spirit to fall, mm. and Jesus is about to ascend to heaven, and he's in this situation where he's ascending to heaven and being told, uh, or and the disciples are being told, "Hey guys, listen up." There's something new going to happen. You're going to be empowered. Mm. You need to sit still, and they do. They pray, and they're in the upper room, and they're seeking the Lord, and they need to wait. They need to wait for the Spirit of God to fall. And when we come to chapter 2, they recognize that this is what was told to them, that the Holy Spirit's going to fall upon them. And so we know then that when the Spirit falls, that they are going to be emboldened to share the gospel and to spread it out. And that's exactly what the church does. They take the advice on an application level and they start spreading the word from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and then to the ends of the earth. Mm. Okay. So, I mean, again, you made over 50 observations in Prof. Hendricks' class. Yeah. So we don't have to go through all 50, but just some observations you know, that I'm making in addition to the ones that you're talking about, that there is something that they're going to receive, which is power. Um, there is a, a character, the Holy Spirit. So there's this person. So that's a reference to that. Um, again, you're talking about there's the spreading out. There's a location, like a local, uh, you know, there's there's Jerusalem and Judea. So these are actually in historical places. Um there's witnessing going on. So we would talk about what, what witnessing is. So maybe in that sense, what, what is this word witnessing? What are some of the observations that we need to glean from this word witnessing here that we're going to be my witnesses to Jerusalem and so on? Uh, witness is the Greek word for martyr. Okay. Uh, so you will be my martyrs. Okay. Well, uh, how about that? Right. Yeah. And how true that was. Yeah. <laughs> and so when we think about being as witnesses, we, uh, we're basically saying we're going to be as martyrs if need be. Uh, the other thing about Acts 1.8 as an observation is it's a promise. Okay. You shall receive power yeah. when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Hmm. Uh, and it's a collective you. So, I mean, this is going to fall on all of them. Not only that, uh, we see that this is fulfillment of Joel chapter 2. Uh, we learned that when the Spirit falls that they're going to have visions and they're going to have dreams. And yeah. so, we learn when we go to Acts 2 that part of Joel chapter 2 is fulfilled at Pentecost. And so Pentecost is a word that means 50. Hmm. And this, it talks about 50 days after Jesus, uh, you know, would die and rise from the grave that this would take place. So it's pretty cool that all the historical details start coming together. Jesus dies on Passover, the spirit of God falls on Pentecost. And so, so much fulfillment. I mean, if you go back to Daniel 9 in verses 24 to 27, uh, we can even learn that it, it, that the Messiah would be cut off and speaking of his death. And so there's fulfillment there. So it's incredibly rich what happens, that the promise falls first on the Jews, right? right? And so on the disciples and people would gather for Pentecost. They would travel from all over the known world and they would access uh, the roads. The Roman road system was perfectly in place. We know in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. What made the gospel so strategic at that time is the Roman road system uh, was p properly positioned so that at Pentecost, when the Spirit to God falls. And when the people who traveled to Jerusalem for that time, when they went back, they could go back to the surrounding lands as witnesses and taking the gospel out to Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Well, I think just like the web that is created from these observations with this one single verse uh, is astounding. And I think that can be sometimes overwhelming for people. So, um, but there are all these pieces and it shows how so much of this fits together, how, you know, we're referencing the Old Testament, um, we're referencing what's going to happen kind of in the rest of the book of Acts. And so these are all just coming from observations of this one verse. And so how awful it can be if you just read one verse and kind of ignore some of the surrounding, surrounding context, you're right. really getting, you know, really diving into really what you're observing there. Um, I noticed I was watching a conversation between, uh, you know, two theologians and they were looking at some end times passages, which those can be, you know, re really, you know, it can trip us up a lot sometimes. But I think the one person, you know, kind of said, well, this is what the verse is saying. And the other person came back and said, well, well no, let, let's, let's really look at these verses. And so the first person kind of paraphrased what was going on. The other person read 
the verses and noticed it was the exact opposite of what was going on that the first person said. And so I think that we can, if we're not careful, we can kind of breeze over kind of what's going on if we don't keep this observation step really important. So, Oh yeah, and that's really important because what you have happening in verse eight, notice what we're doing a lot of. Uh, it's a principle, interpret the text in light of the context. Right. And so Acts 1.8, if you're going to dive right in to the middle of a chapter or the beginning of a chapter yeah. in isolated verse, you need to study the surrounding context. Mm -hmm. The best Bible teachers, and this is what I've loved about my time at Dallas Theological Seminary, I do think that they produce some of the greatest preachers. I mean, think about some of the preachers who've come out of there, from Tony Evans to Chuck Swindoll to Andy Stanley to Tommy Nelson to Chip Ingram. To Bobby Conway. Oh, geez, yeah. yeah. Well, they. I do think that they're great Bible teachers, and I think a lot of it's rooted in uh, observation. Mm. Uh, when somebody just jumps into the interpretive level, uh, they don't point out a lot of details. And I see myself as a teacher, Tim, as a tour guide. Right. Uh, my job is to take people on a tour, but the deal is, is when you're preaching the Word of God or when you're leading a small group, you don't want to get off on tangents on all the observations. Hmm. You want to show the observations that support the interpretation of the text. It's like a tour guide. Hey, yeah. check that out, but you remember the big picture. So hmm. if you are a tour guide leader and you take people on a tour into uh, the Sistine Chapel, which Michael Angelo uh, painted, uh, you want to keep the focus on that painting. You right. might point out some other interesting historical facts, but when people go away, they should have a great appreciation of Michelangelo, uh, how long it took him to paint it, some of the details that went into the painting, what the scene represented. And so if the tour guide's pointing out some of the art, what's going on here, the type of art that Michelangelo did, and showing all that, uh, then after making those observations, then they'll be in a position to be able to say, as a tour guide, this is what the purpose served in doing this. And then if the a tour guide even wanted to give an application, uh, it could be something like this. Uh, where in your life are you seeking to show beauty mm. uh, in the world to others? Michael Angelo saw beauty. In fact, with his David, he was also an amazing sculptor. Right. He saw this just basically this rock and and, he, and what everybody would see is just this big clump. Yeah. He saw David yeah. and he chipped away everything that didn't look like David. Mm. And so in our lives, God wants to sanctify us to make us look like Jesus mm. so that we can be a beautiful portrait of Christ to the world that we live in. Excellent. Well, we, we've spent considerable amount of time on observation, and I think that's an example of how often we don't observe things in the text and maybe how we should reprioritize uh, our Bible reading to really do this observation step first. So after observation, because we could probably could spend the, the rest yeah. of the program talking about observation because there's a lot here. Um, wh what's the next step after observation? What do we go to next? Well, now we're ready to make an interpretive uh claim on the text. Okay. And so we need to remember there's one interpretation, many applications. Okay. There's one interpretation from God's perspective. I get it. There's lots of different perspectives. You just pointed this out in the book of Revelation. People are bringing up all this stuff mm -hmm. or in end times. People will do that. And that doesn't mean that the Bible doesn't have one interpretation. It just means that we're fallible as humans. And sometimes we arrive at that. Right. But we do our best to make good interpretation. So what's the interpretation of Acts 1a? Well, the interpretation is this. Acts 1.8 was written to tell us that oh, the Holy Spirit is going to empower the church to take the gospel to the nations. Mm. And that's what we learn from that particular passage. And so once we make that claim, uh, then we come to the application stage. Okay. And so interestingly enough, our homework then, even as teachers, we spend a considerable amount of time reading different translations, looking for textual problems that emerge. Uh, we consult the commentaries. Uh, we, we look for the different words that we need to do word studies on. We make our observations. We take copious notes on that. And then we know what the text is and we come up with a big idea. And that big idea is what we're going to preach and what we're going to teach, uh, you know? And so if I was going to teach this message, I might entitle it, uh, you know, you will be my witnesses right. or something like that. Yeah. But when we come to the application stage, uh, you know, let's back up. In observation, that answers the question, what do I see? Okay. An interpretation 
answers the question, what does it mean? Okay. Application answers the question, how does it work? Okay. So this is important because a lot of times teachers miss out on the application stage. In James 1, verse 22, James writes, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, do what it says. Right. Prof Hendricks had this quote, it was powerful. It was descriptive, but it got the point. He said, um, interpretation is without application is like spiritual abortion. Mm. Uh, that we have this we have this command upon us to live the word. And so that's our ultimate goal, yeah. not to sit around and point out interesting facts, not to sit around and show how smart we are with uh, giving a good interpretation. And by the way, a good teacher should not only show the interpretation that he can do, he should show other interpretations that fit within orthodoxy, mm. recognizing some epistemic humility that we don't have it all figured out. Right. So on an application level then, Tim, what would this look like? Well, as a pastor, what I would want to say is that, thank God for the witnesses of Jesus Christ. If they weren't sharing the gospel and spreading out, we wouldn't be having church today. It's because of their faithfulness, because of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and their belief in it, that they took the gospel to the ends of the earth, that it arrived with us. And now we have the responsibility to still take that on. Mm. And so then I might ask some questions. Are you a witness for Christ? Mm. Have you ever known the joy of sharing Jesus with others? Who are some of the non-believers in your sphere of influence that God wants you to reach? Maybe in yeah. your neighborhood, in your workplace, in your home, relatives, friends. And so what I'm doing is I'm painting a picture for them so that they can have a greater awareness. Jesus said the harvest is ripe, uh, but the laborers are few. Yeah. Pray, therefore, to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest field. And so then I might say something like this on an application level. This week, I want to encourage you to be open to being a witness for Christ and to do that by praying for God to give you an open door. And then getting involved in a spiritual conversation with somebody. Mm. And next week, when you go to your small group, share how Jesus used you to be a witness, how to be a martyr for Christ. And that's all, that's awesome. I think one question that comes up um, as we're kind of thinking through some of this, and I'm not sure where it would fall, I'm guessing it would fall in the application stage, but when we're talking about the audience or who like who the audience is, how do we make the leap between the the kind of local audience and us? So how do we know that if they're like, okay, that was just for what was going on there at that time, and this is going on for us, this is communicating yeah, to that's us. Great so question. Like a lowercase U or a capital U in that case. So how should we think about is that on the observation stage, the interpretation application, it kind of maybe crosses all three of those. Like when we think yeah. about I'm thinking about the passage um, where Jesus is talking to the rich young ruler and he says, sell all that you have. Mm. Um, is that is that an application for me? You know, like am I what if I say I'm not supposed to go to Judea, Samaria and to the ends of the earth? That's not for me. That's just for the these people right here. How do we think about some of that? Well, you bring up an excellent passage right there. So you have this rich young ruler and he walks away sad because he wouldn't give up all he had. So right. the, the danger would be to read that and think, oh, I got to go sell all of my possessions. Mm -hmm. What Jesus was doing was addressing this rich young ruler's specific heart problem. He was showing him what his obstacle is to getting in the way of becoming a disciple of Christ. Mm -hmm. And so it might be that it's riches for one person, but Abraham was rich. David was rich. And so there's nothing wrong with being rich. The problem is if money has us. And so what we would want to do then on an application stage is we would want to say, you know, the rich young ruler struggled with material uh, idolatry. Right. He struggled with money and he couldn't let it go so much so it got in the way. Mm. Maybe you're a non-believer and you want to know what it would look like to follow Jesus. Well, what is the what are the idols in your life? Yeah. Maybe it's lust. Maybe it's money. Maybe it's power. You right. need to figure out whatever that idol is that's holding on you uh, as a prisoner right. and causing you to not surrender to Jesus. And that's the way you would do it. Unfortunately, some people go turn that passage into a poverty gospel mm -hmm. and cast that on everybody. Right. When it comes to being witnesses in the context that we have, we clearly see, according to the Great Commission in Matthew 28, we see in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, we see in many other areas that this is a universal command 
to the church to be witnesses for Christ. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great point is that you're, you're seeing it at other places if it's not isolated, right? So we, we see a command, uh, not only just a command, but we also see the application of it throughout the book of Acts, as you said, throughout the rest of the New Testament with Paul, but then throughout church history, that that's how it was understood, that it didn't just, that message of, um, you know, go into the rest of the world and be my witnesses continued on mm. after just that single group of people. And so that gives us another indication, I think, of what you're talking about as application. So that's right. So get out that memo pad, write down some observations, have some commentaries, have some different translations of the Bible, write out what the interpretation is after you do your homework, and then ask yourself at the end of reading Acts chapter one, what's the application that God is inviting you into for the day? Excellent. Well, I hope you as the audience uh, took everything that Bobby said and this method, and now you can apply it to your reading because it is excellent. It really works. And it's uh, quite amazing that we often don't do that. With that, we will meet you again next time on The Unapologetic Show.